Hey y'all, this podcast is meant for mature audiences only and contains strong adult language. So if you are under 18, be out. We discuss our experiences, thoughts, and tips on ethical non-monogamy from the perspective of a black married couple. We smart, but we not experts. So this show is for entertainment purposes only. So whether you working out, driving, or listening to us on your home sound system, enjoy the show. This is the Black and Kinky Lifestyle. Yo, you know... I had the craziest experience this week. Hmm. I was walking to the gym. I hadn't been there in a while because we know we've been on vacation. You know, the end of the summer always brings these flurry of activity that kind of takes you out of your routine. And I'm trying to get back into mine right now. The fall is starting and, you know, the, the trees are starting to turn colors. And I'm trying to get back in shape again. All that excess vacation weight I'm trying to burn off again. So <laughs> I go to the gym and to get to the gym, I have to cross this this pretty big highway. It's a six lane highway, three lanes going north, three lanes going south. I do this all the time. And after I cross this six lane highway, I look to my right and I see that somebody is on the divider. The medium. The medium. There we go. Looking for the word here. And there's this man that is on the ground. Um, At first, he looks like a pile of clothing that's just blowing in the wind. But this man is like laying on the ground, but not really laying on the ground, kind of crawling on the ground, but not really crawling on the ground either, because he's moving in such an abnormal way. It's hard to describe, but you know, I feel like there's a part of our brain that understands how human beings are supposed to move. That's even why if I don't like injured. Uh, body horror. Yeah. The movies where there's like a, like the Slender Man, how mm-hmm. the Slender Man is supposed to move or movies where there is a possession. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I'm reminded of The Ring or some of those uh, other Japanese or Korean horror films where they have figured out the secret, the simple, like it's not about CGI or anything like that. Just really unusual looking shit. Like what was the day shift? Day Shift, yes. Day Shift with Jamie Foxx, Jamie Fox, which was a great film. It's on Netflix. Super, super awesome. But they hired like contortionists mm-hmm. to be in some of the... Instead scenes. of using like special effects like CGI and stuff. That's right. And so a lot of those characters are moving in some really unusual ways. And that's how this guy was moving on the ground. He was sort of kind of in a jerky movement trying to crawl on his elbows. And his pants were pulled all the way down to his ankles. He had on boxers, so he wasn't bare-assed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he was rolling on his back, then rolling back on his front, and then rolling on his side. And then at some point, he rolled into the street and start, car started stopping because they didn't run, want to run over this man. And I'm looking in his direction, and I'm like, holy shit, I'm about, to, I'm about to witness some really gruesome shit. Because the cars that drive on this highway are going up towards like 75 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. And he will get vaporized if he gets <laughs> hit. Mm -hmm. by one of these cars and i've never seen that shit before cars are slowing down though like this isn't you know this isn't like in new york right Mm -hmm. (laughs) people are like stopping and so i i'm slowly making my way towards him and i'm pretty cautious because i am from new york and you know in new york we ignore people when they're going crazy (laughs) um and that's what was happening here and so you know i'm walking slowly up to this guy because you don't know people could be pulling all kinds of shit on you and you don't know what kind Mm -hmm. of mental state he's going to be on i don't want to walk up to him and then he fucking pushed me into a fucking truck and then you're you know cashing in a life insurance policy um (laughs) And so I walk up to him. I mean, I'm walking up slowly, but I notice there's this white woman. He was a black guy, by the way. This white woman comes running into the street. She's stopping traffic. Where I'm did like, she come from? I didn't see her because there was a car, um, you know, on uh, the intersection. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was waiting on the other side of the road. Um, mm-hmm. And I was walking towards her, but there was a car like in my path. Mm-hmm. I know that car was there because the passenger of I mean, the driver of the car was like, yo, you see this nigga? And, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, 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 I see him. So then I couldn't like keep walking. Now I had to do something. All right. So that's when I see her. She runs across the street and she beckons me over to come and help. And now I'm in this situation at mm-hmm. this point. Now I'm 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 in it. So then I, I go across the street uh, because at this at this point, cars have stopped, but their patience is wearing thin. And some of them just sort of, you know, yeah, sort of drive past me. And then I come up to him and, you know, at this point, some other motor has stopped. Some good Samaritans. Yeah. Mm hmm. Good Samaritans. There we go. I'm like, yo, what's going on? What's wrong with this guy? And the woman tells me, she's a friend of his apparently, that he's high on PCP. And me and the, me and the other Samaritan, we say at the same time, PCP? <laughs> like, what? 
Are motherfuckers are still taking that shit. I have yet to meet somebody who's like, yo, PCP is an awesome drug. You should try no. it. I've never heard anyone say that. Mm-mm. So anyway, at some point we rush him across the street and we we protect this man. There's like four, four black people uh, in total <laughs> that have stopped. His white friend just kind of disappeared. She's talking to the cops who eventually showed up. But we are like really watching over this guy because we know how things can escalate once police get on the scene. And this mm-hmm. guy's on PCP. I know if I was having a bad trip and somebody said, cops are here, like I'd freak out too. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we're like, yo, relax. You know, the cops are here, but we got you, brother. (laughs) And at some point, EMS came and they took him away. I never made it to the gym that day. But there was such a powerful sense of community Mm -hmm. because there was one point at which we all had our hands on this brother. We were, were, you know, we got him up standing and and we we needed to balance him. So everybody had a hand on him, just one hand. And he had his head down because he was still kind of, you know, getting over his trip but he was like it it was like a prayer circle and it was there was there was so much love in that moment and he couldn't have been much uh younger than me Mm -hmm. uh but i you know like to think that we may have saved his life that day oh yeah so anyway i bring up that story because this episode is somewhat in honor of people who risk their lives to save lives Mm. all the time and we're going to talk about Black swingers in the armed forces. All right, let's get to the show. everybody welcome to the black and kinky lifestyle podcast this is the bomber and the bell so topic of the day so one of the things we noticed in our lifestyle journey over the years is just how diverse the lifestyle is now when it comes to swingers although it's easy to find certain demographics mainly middle-aged white folks once we started spending time networking and getting to know other groups and traveling to other locations it became quickly apparent that the swingers come in all shapes and sizes from all backgrounds some are professionals blue-collar workers etc but one of the things we noticed is that there is one group of black couples we have run into fairly frequently and that is couples who are either currently in the military or retired from the military. Now, at first, we assumed that this was due to our proximity to the D.C. area. D.C. is our nation's capital, of course, and surrounding the capital are several military bases, including the Pentagon, although the Pentagon, I never really considered a military base, but I was looking up lists of military bases in D.C., and technically, the Pentagon is a military base. Did you Mm -hmm. ever think of the Pentagon as a military base? No. So there might be some discrepancy there, but, you know, Generally, there are all these other military bases, and so it is reasonable to assume that the swinger community that is around the D.C. area would have a high proportion of folks that are in the military. But we started meeting a lot of military personnel in other areas of the country we travel to and even seeing folks on different lifestyle platforms that didn't live in this area and were clearly in the military given how they describe themselves and how they describe themselves on their profiles. Now, this may also have a lot to do with the reality that military military bases are spread throughout the country. There are approximately 500 of them. The largest military base in the country isn't even near DC. It's actually in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, or it's the Fort Bragg military base in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. There are approximately 1.3 million people in active on active duty, half a million in reserves and in insane, like, like some estimates of almost 20 million total retired military personnel living in the United States, like 7% of the population. Mm -hmm. And according to the American Legion article from 2021, there are 2.15 million black military veterans nationwide. I mean, that was a lot. I think one thing I always have to... (laughs) I always have to bring up racial justice in here. One thing we talk about is that we see a lot of blacks in the military because the armed forces also has predatory recruiting practices in mm-hmm. uh, low income and underrepresented neighborhoods. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's that. <laughs> yeah. And some estimates have suggested that uh, 
like almost half of the military are representative of people of color, mm-hmm. uh, active duty. Not quite, maybe somewhere in the 40 percentile range, um, but there are a lot. And of course, that includes folks beyond African Americans. Yeah. There are clearly a lot of Latinos and Asians in the military as well. And there, there, there has been some discussion, I'm glad you brought that up, because there has been some discussion on, well, although there is great diversity in the military, who are actually occupying the positions of power and authority in the mm-hmm. military? And there has been some um, disparities in that regard. But that's not really what this episode is about. (laughs) Another conversation for another day. Um, but I'd say it's really hard to find information on this topic. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, of all the things that I've had to do research on, this was probably one of the most difficult. And for that reason, we decided that we were just going to ask, you know, one of the questions we had was what, what are so many, why are there so many military personnel in the lifestyle? And honestly, it could be the case that there's no greater percentage of military folks in the lifestyle relative to medical personnel, law enforcement, other professions, and you know there's nothing on un- there's nothing unusual about the proportion of people in the military in the lifestyle. That may actually be the case. I'm not sure, but what I am sure of is that we've just run into a lot of people in the military. So, and a lot of black people in the military, particularly. Um, And so we just asked our audience, you know, we went on Instagram, we went on our band chat. I think I posted something on Twitter and just reached out to folks and asked our listeners, like, what are some reasons you think there are so many people from the military, whether that's the air force, the Navy, um, army why are so many of them in the lifestyle and we got a number of answers and in today's episode we're actually going to feature a conversation i had with a couple who are retired military from the air force in particular that's as much justice as we could have done to this topic Mm -hmm. so if people are listening listening to this and they're like oh bomber actually somebody did a lot of research on this topic or there's been a lot of chatter on this topic from you know x source please respond to us and let us know because i'm i'm really interested in this and i have many theories some of which i will we will share on on the show today. So uh, let's just jump into it. So on Instagram, there were two responses that I just want to highlight before we get into some of the some of the research on it. So Mocha Vixen 86 says the rumor is it started in the Air- Army Air Corps after World War Two. And Swingin' Flamingo said, we've heard stories since day one, the lifestyle basically started with deployed troops, that the only people they wanted looking out for and taking care of their wives were other military brethren. That makes sense. I haven't heard this before. From my origin understanding is that kind of, uh, it came out of the 60s free love movement mm-hmm. kind of thing. But that's interesting. I hadn't heard that before. I, I think it makes sense. I think someone in our band chat said, you know, you have people in close proximity, men and women, for a long time, and stuff is going to happen, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, just eventually things are going to happen. And it makes sense if you know you're close to somebody and you want, you know, your wife or your spouse taken care of, and you know that they have the, the same level of or similar level of skill and, you know, whatever, because there's obviously some similarities for you all being in the military, not all the time. But possibly the case that you would want that person instead of a random being with your person mm-hmm. while you're away. Mm-hmm. I also thought that swinging was some somewhat of a phenomenon that started from the free love movement because, mm-hmm. you know, contraception is available and, you know, there are the some of the lifelong consequences of se- sexual promiscuity weren't necessarily as much of an issue. And this is, of course, before AIDS. Um, <laughs> but before that, it was just, you know, maybe you catch something and, 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 and take, a, take a pill for a week or something like that, mm-hmm. and you'll be okay. That was really the only thing to worry about. Um, but there might be some validity to what folks shared on, on Instagram, because according to Christopher Ryan of Psycho- Psychology Today, uh, and I'm just going to read this out, it seems that the origin of modern American swingers came from a crew of World War II Air Force pilots and their wives. 
like elite warriors everywhere, these top guns often develop strong bonds with one another, perhaps because they suffered the highest casualty rate of any branch of the military. And shout out to Top Gun Maverick. That movie was awesome. I suggest you guys check it out. Uh, according to journalist Terry Gold, key parties originated from from these networks where couples are invited to attend a party with a bunch of other couples and one partner leaves their car keys in a bowl later the other partner selects a random key from the bowl and goes home with that partner who owns those keys and so this apparently originated in military bases in the 1940s where elite pilots and their wives intermingled sexually with one another before the men flew off towards Japanese aircraft fire so there might be some validity to that. We'll have the link to that article in the in the show notes for today. So thanks for sharing those perspectives with us. We were, you know, once I heard that, I was able to find a lot of articles that actually wrote about that phenomenon, uh, that it is something that started in World War II and not necessarily the 60s. Although there are some other conversations we've had, and I know other lifestyle podcasts that have talked about swinging starting even long before that. All right. So let's read the next comment we heard off of Instagram. So this one is from Mix Mix Sex Couple 916. When I was in the Air Force at 19 overseas, I was wilding. I enjoyed the free sexual spirit I had. When I got out of the military, I still had that calling, but didn't have anywhere to release it at. I never heard of the lifestyle other than what I saw in old movies with the keys in the bowl type of parties. And I thought those didn't exist, just something on TV. But when I found a real lifestyle event and I attended, I knew I was home. Not only vets, but a lot of peace officers are in the lifestyle. I think it's comforting to just let go in a safe space. So it draws peace officers, active military, and vets to the lifestyle. I mean, we've been only in, in terms of being a safe space, I think there's only been maybe one or two occasions where like somebody has done something crazy. And there's definitely been someone else there that's like been able to either de de escalate the situation or remove the person or something like that. So I've never been, I don't think I've ever been at a lifestyle event or party where I felt physically unsafe, but I don't know if that was due to, you know, the number of military or retired military there or just the environment in general, you know? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, second sentence says, when I was in the Air Force at 19 overseas, I was wild and I enjoyed that free spirit, this free, free spirit I had. So it really wasn't, it didn't seem like it was something about being in the Air Force that that did this, um, but they already had it within them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that same thing they had within them, the same thing that sort of drew them into the lifestyle is the same thing that drew them into the military. And it could be just maybe there's some level of fearlessness. Maybe there's some craving for adventure. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some craving for just getting into different experiences, lifestyles. Um, you know, people in the military have to travel quite a bit. So if you're a homebody, if you're somebody who doesn't like to travel, somebody who just likes to stay in the same environment all the time, being in the military can be a really difficult lifestyle mm -hmm. um and so people who aren't afraid of that or in in uh more uh specifically um people who embrace that may be both more likely to join the military and more likely to be open to non-conventional relationship dynamics right mm -hmm. so dutch has also responded to this and she said, I think there are they are more cultured and move around a lot. So anonymity is easier, mm. which is true. Like if you, you know, you could be, you know, getting deployed or shipped out somewhere the next day, you know, have an experience and just go to a completely different continent. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I know we're not in the military, but think about this. Think about what she's talking about here. I think there are more cultured and they move a lot. So anonymity is easier. I, I feel like this sounds like you. Well, see, the thing that I was thinking about, too, is, like, I feel like there are a lot of parallels with um, individuals that, you know, went to 
you know, liberal arts colleges or, Mm -hmm. you know, went to universities and it pursued higher education too. Um, you know, you're young, you're out on your own, you know, for the first time, a lot of time going far away from home. Um, not all the time, but, you know, trying to figure out life. So I think, I think a part of it is just that age, like that 19 mm-hmm. to 21 kind of age. You're just, you're up for exploration. Um, and so you you might get if you're fortunate to have the opportunity you might get a lot of different experiences and get the opportunity to you know express express your sexual freedom like i was wilding at 19 too i wasn't in the military right but i was definitely a sexually free fit spirit Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) you know so yeah and you're living in dormitories right you're you're, like living with your you're with your peers Mm -hmm. you know you're away from your parents away from your neighborhood yeah um and yeah shit gets wild yeah um, and there might be just a more a a more welcoming spirit when it comes to engaging in some of those things later on in life when yeah. you're in a, in, a, in a relationship. All right, Urban Swingers responded to this. I like theirs. Go ahead. So they said long rotations and deployments can strain relationships. So I believe that military couples, law enforcement in general, turn to the lifestyle to satisfy satisfy what's missing: the physical touch that we all crave, along with being cultured and having anonymity. I feel like. That question can be posed about healthcare workers as well. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, at some point, I might bring bring on some nurses up in here because I know some nurse. I know some male nurses, and they tell me it gets real in these hospitals. I don't even know how y'all keep it sanitary. <laughs> but I did want to talk about the the issue Urban Swingers brought up around long rotations and deployments becoming a strain on relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, th- I want to talk about that because I went on militaryonesource.com, um, which offers advice to military couples. They offer so- uh, services as well. And I came across these big issues that strain relationships for couples that are actually in the military. And I just wanted to talk to them, talk about them and, and specifically talk about how the lifestyle or ethical mono- monogamy ethical non-monogamy in general may help mitigate some of the challenges here. So the first one is frequent separation. So uh, deployment and temporary duty assignments mean that military members spend more time away from home than the average civilian. Being geographically separated can also bring up a host of other issues, including concerns about being faithful to one another. How would the lifestyle like help something like this? Well, yeah, if you're, you know, you know your part, your partner is going to be away for a certain period of times. Um, whether you decide that you can, you know, openly date separately or have, you know, specific groups of people that they can engage with, so that they're not, you know, cheating unethically, you know, getting with other people, that it makes sense, and then everybody can be satisfied and happy. Mm-hmm. All right, so I think that the frequent separation thing, I suspect it puts people, it could put some people in the military in a position where they, yes, they have to think and communicate really openly and honestly about what their needs are in a relationship where they're not supposed to, where they, where they can't see each other all the time. Mm-hmm. And they, ha- they have to face that reality. They can't sort of deny that reality. I also, want, one of the theories I had, and theory is a big, big word for what I'm about to share is that I suspect people in the military have and there might be another word for this another term for this and I'm just like making it up and because I like the way it sounds (laughs) but the tolerance for the unconventional Mm -hmm. and so I suspect people in the military I mean there's just there might be a lot of different things you have to face head on that requires a degree of bravery. It requires a degree of just like, okay, this is scary, but we're, I'm going to have to deal with this. There is a sense of duty and there's just a sense of putting on your big boy pants. Mm-hmm. I suspect the same is true for cops. I suspect the same is true for some healthcare workers that are facing the, you know, the possibility of, I don't know, death or injury Mm -hmm. um, uh, of oneself or one's colleagues. And there's just a brotherhood and there's just a loyalty there. And so I, I suspect that, 
you know, having a conversation about like, look, this is what I want. And if we're not going to be together all the time, like I need to talk about how I'm going to get what I want without losing you. And that conversation may not necessarily be as harsh as it is for somebody who may be in sort of a softer profession. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's that's just a theory I have. So so this was a good one. And interestingly enough, in the interview that you all are going to hear in a moment, that very issue is going to come up in the conversation. So I look forward Forward to you all hearing that. Hey, fellow BNK fans. I know y'all are enjoying the show, but damn, we have to wait a month for each episode. I don't know about you, but that's way too long for me. That is one of the many reasons I support Bomber and Bell on Patreon. They release content on their Patreon every week. I really can't get enough of their Pillow Talk episodes where they get real personal. And girl, it's like having a backstage pass to your favorite artist. It also doesn't hurt to hear my name shouted out every episode and have ready access to the Bell and the Bomber through their private chat. If y'all want to join in the fun, head to www.patreon.com forward slash black and kinky and donate a few dollars a month to keep the show going. I know it's for a good cause and all that, but I'm just trying to get my fair share of this sexy ass podcast. Speaking of which, I'm finna finish this episode. So the second, the second um, source of strain for relationships is permanent change of station move. So moving every few years as a military couple can be exciting because you get to experience new places, but it can also be stressful. The work of packing up your home, feeling of loss as you say goodbye to your old community and anxiety about finding your way around a new environment can affect your relationship. So I want, I, this, this might be a tricky one, but for a military couple, and that's what I'm going to call them, military couple, who's in the lifestyle, who's facing that very stress, stressful or stressor, how might the lifestyle be like something that could help that? Well, I think it's, you know, even though I think the lifestyle has its own flavor in different places, at least you know that there is a community with like-minded people that you can immediately tap into wherever you go, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, no matter if you're moving from California to New York or D.C. or Chicago or wherever, you know that there is a community that you can immediately engage in that is has like minded people that you can, you know, that you share same interests with. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I, I love what you said there because it reminds me that every time we travel somewhere new, the first thing I do all the time is I'll get on like Swinger Lifestyle or, you know, SLS or Cassidy and I'll just look up what's going on in the community we're about to go to, mm-hmm. like what the clubs are, like what, you know, if there are any hot dates out there, usually there are, but that's kind of the fun of like traveling to a new place, right? You could sort of find a new subculture of the lifestyle. Um, yeah, so, we haven't done that hot date thing in a while, but <laughs> I don't think we need to. <laughs> no, we. I don't, I don't even know if we have at all, to tell you the truth. We find an event and we might go to a house party. But like when it comes to a, a hot date, like there'll be a couple. For those of you who don't know, SLS has this function where you can, you know, sort of click on this hot dates link. And it will allow you to see all the couples who have these open invites who might be in town, who in some cases they in some cases they may say, hey, I'm going to be at X and Y party. Message us if you're going to be there, if you're interested in meeting up. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other times it'll just be a couple who's like, hey, we have like a free night. We're just going to be out on the town. We're going to be at this restaurant or we can go to another restaurant. Like we'd like to meet up with another couple. If you're interested, message us. Or sometimes it'll be a couple that's just in a hotel room for the evening and they're Mm -hmm. just like, hey, you know, come through. (laughs) <laughs> like we're going to be at this hotel or mm-hmm. we're going to be at a hotel come through. And so looking at some of that stuff could be exciting, but we haven't done it because we're more so event whores rather than, you know, mm-hmm. private meetups. Okay. The third strain on relationships um, that are um, military relationships Uh, is transition. So military life is full of them and many bring mixed emotions. Returning from a deployment is joyous, but can strain your relationship as you get used to being together again. Interesting. 
So I think this is talking about the transition, or more specifically, I'll say the transition of coming back home after being separated for a while. Mm -hmm. So how do you think the lifestyle helps with this or could help? You know, I think it can offer the opportunity to, like I say, for us, like we don't always have to be up under each other. So it can offer the opportunity to just get away for a little bit. If you go to a party, you can get the opportunity to date each other, to really feel like you're you're dating each other. Not that you have to be in the lifestyle to do that, but having an opportunity to get dressed up and feel good and look good with your partner, I think is helpful to rekindle that, Mm -hmm. bring yourselves together after a time being apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things we talk about in a lifestyle is like reconnecting, Mm -hmm. which I think is what you're getting at. Yeah. And there's, there's a, I think that's a a norm in the lifestyle to really think about reconnection. Mm -hmm. The other thing is focus her into that hot wife stuff or Mm -hmm. sort of hearing about sexual experiences you may have had while you were separated. I can imagine people who are comfortable with that. You know, that's one way of sort of spicing up the transition or or making it sort of an easier and hotter experience. Uh, But I don't know. That's just some that's just a guess I'm, I'm making. But I think the whole emphasis on reconnection sex. Uh, could be a big deal and very helpful uh, in that degree. All right. Um, So there were two more responses we got on Instagram. You want to read this first one out? So the first one's from Unlimited Heart Freedom. Uh, My personal theory is that military service people are trained to do everything in units, platoons, squads, etc. Being alone probably feels pretty unnatural for them after a while. Plus, many have PTSD or other mental health issues to process and do better with support around them. And after life in the service, privacy and modesty are a lot less of a thing. When they leave the service, many feel guilt for leaving their unit behind. I bet if they had the option, they'd stay together forever, sharing partners and watching each other's backs. People would muster out of Andrews or Norfolk and head directly to the home already established by their unit mates who went before them. And then from Tev D1, uh, being in the military, you find yourself befriending people you would have never been around. And that breaks down some of the preconceived notions and opens your mind to more ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, So I'm happy uh, somebody mentioned uh, some some of the mental health aspects there, um, which is something we're, we're, we're not getting into in this episode. But I know and understand that that is that can be a significant issue. And the reality that being in the military just opens you up to other networks and other people that you normally wouldn't be around and sort of being open to that and open to more ideas. I, you know, Again, very parallel to the lifestyle and and some of what it, some of what it takes to build relationships in the lifestyle and ethical non monogamous circles in general. So thank you all for all of your responses. These were really like thoughtful and really gave gave us a lot to chew on, even though there isn't a whole lot of material online about this kind of thing that we can find anyway. So anyway. Um, what we're going to do now is actually transition into our into our interview with a, actually a couple who has retired from the Air Force, a black couple who's retired from the Air Force, and they just talk about their journey and the lifestyle. It's ATL, who's the male, and Shy, who is the female in the relationship. You can guess where they're from originally. <laughs> Everybody, I'm really happy today at this in this segment because we are actually going to talk to a couple who has been in the military. They're retired now, but we are actually going to talk to a couple who has some experience in the military. So I am really excited because I have uh, Shy and ATL on the show to talk to us about this topic. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Hi what are you doing? ATL. And you guys, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. And I'm wondering if we could just get started with you all just telling us a little bit about how you met. Tell us that story. He stalked me on the airplane when I was getting off of it in Japan. He has a different version, but. uh, I would use the word stalked. (laughs) Uh, There I was sitting, waiting on my plane. And I happened to see this cute chocolate email come off of her plane for the most part. And 
I was going TDY to another part of Japan. She was just getting stationed there and there was a rotator aircraft. The aircraft landed, she got off and I noticed her, but in the same breath, I, we were still, I was getting on the plane basically uh, to go somewhere else. It just so happened that we were both getting stationed in the same location. So I ran across her again in a dormitory room by chance. And that's basically how we met. Uh, I'd seen him after he, I didn't know that I saw that he saw me, but I saw him maybe a week or so later after arriving on the base. And I was walking with a girlfriend of mine to go into what they call the BX. And I was like, who's that kid with the Xbox backpack? I was like, who does that? (laughs) And (laughs) later on that night or that Saturday or that Sunday, because it was the weekend, we go to the club on base and who do I see taking over the dance floor, but the same kid with the xbox backpack only this time he looked much different and come to find out we did live in the same dorm and we met over actually dvds at the time so he had a large dvd collection my stuff hadn't gotten there yet we started talking he had a ton of movies and that's kind of how we started talking and that was what 20 years ago right 22 yeah this was before the netflix and chill thing so yeah (laughs) right something else DVD to watch. and chill. <laughs> DVD D- and chill. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you saw him dancing. You saw you saw ATL getting it in on the dance floor. Is that the thing that sold you? You saw him getting it in? It made me a little bit more interested than the kid with the Xbox backpack that I had seen <laughs> earlier in that week. So it was another side of him. Yo, why, what, see. why is Shy hating on the Xbox? You don't like gamers? <laughs> if, what is this anti-gaming well, culture we got? We could still be I, sexy and be gamers. And they, you can because, I, you know, 20 years later and he's still a gamer and I'm still here. So it's very <laughs> sexy. Yeah, I've grown to love it about him. So. You mentioned the dormitory. So when you say dormitory, I'm assuming that they were that, you know, they weren't unisex dormitories, but maybe I'm wrong about that. So this particular one was the way they played it out was depending on your rank, if the lower ranking individuals would all stay in the same building for the most part. Uh, and yeah, we, we didn't share rooms, obviously, but we shared common areas. And so she happened to be in a day room. When I walked by, I said hello. And then 20 years later, we're still married. <laughs> Did you all start in the lifestyle before you retired or were you in the lifestyle or ethically non-monogamous while you were still in the in the military, in the Air Force? No, we were monogamous for the first 14 years mm-hmm. of our marriage. And then the last five years is when we've started. And part of that was towards the end of our careers. And then once we fully retired, we've just fully embraced the experience. And Tell me about how you started in the lifestyle. You want to tell the story? You want me to tell it, right? Oh, um, so every other year we tend to do a, a couple's vacation, right? One year we did Hawaii. And then this year when it, the topic came up, we suggested, or I, she suggested that we go to Jamaica because we had never been. And I was like, all right, cool. So here I am sitting at work and I get this text. Hey, I've thought about some places. Here's a list of some hotels that I, you know, in Jamaica that we might be interested in. And so I'm like, all right, cool. Again, I'm in uniform, sitting at my desk, working on my computer or whatever. And in the list, she sends me Hedonism 2. And I'm like, what is Hedonism 2? And so I click on the link. Mind you, I'm at work. There's other people around me, whatever. Um, and then this lifestyle slash uh, clothing optional resort pops up and I turn around look behind me to see if anybody else looking at my phone <laughs> you know I'm like is, are you serious right now and I, I sent her a text back I'm like you know you sent me a lifestyle or a clothing optional resort kind of thing and we had never even talked about any of this stuff before. Mm-hmm. So and keep in mind us. I'm also in Mac- I'm I'm TDY so I'm in Maxwell Alabama and he's where he's at well you said T- TDY having, yeah I was gone for six weeks for school so we weren't even mm-hmm seeing each other for six weeks we were separated at the time where I was at school and he was home you know taking care of the kids and stuff while I was gone and so this is all via text that we're just texting back and forth so y'all haven't seen each other in a while y'all in a long distance thing right Mm -hmm. now and you decide hey I'm I I feel like getting butt naked in Jamaica that's why I'd sent him three resorts. I had sent him Desire Pearl and Temptation (laughs) and I sent him Hito and I was like, okay, 
pick one because I knew I didn't want to hear any kids. I didn't want to hear any crying. Like, I just wanted to be ma'am for a week. You know, can I get your drink, ma'am? Do you need another pillow, ma'am? Like, I just didn't want, I wanted something completely different than what we'd done before. You could have and just, so, you could have just chosen an adult only resort. You went full, like, but hey. like, there are definitely no kids there. Yes. Yeah, um, I know. I've wanted that. <laughs> <laughs> totally caught me off guard. Totally. Uh, wow. I've been doing the research. So I said, well, hey, you know, I'm at work right now. We can talk about this, you know, more when I get back to the house. So that way we can really discuss everything that comes with that. For the most ATL, part. what did you what did you think when you first discovered that that it was a nude? Res- I mean, what did you think of her when she sent that to you? <sighs> it was a paradigm shift. It really. Put her in another light for the most part. I know we had had previous discussions before about my about me not treating her like Claire Huxtable kind of thing as far as our relationship was concerned. But when she sent me the the hotel, I was like, okay, is she really serious or is this a joke? And so once we had the more in-depth conversation about it, that's when I knew she was serious. Can I go back to the Claire Huxtable comment though? So mm-hmm. when you say she she talked to you about not treating her as a Claire Huxtable, what what is, what do you mean by that? Break that down for me. So for me, it was the perception of, okay, I'm the mom taking care of the kids. I have the professional career, you know, being military, I was also in school at the time. So I had all of the buttoned up, laced up, cutesy stuff on the surface, but I'm like, there's more to me than that. There's another side that we haven't really explored. Like, I need you to stop putting me in the clear Huxtable box. Like, I need you to start looking at me as not just this perfect figure like there's another side like let's there's more to me than that than what you see on the surface you know and i i just wanted him to see me as more sensual or see me as more sexual like atl i'm a freak god damn it i'm a freak <laughs> <laughs> i got you <laughs> i want to say that we started going into more for likes and wants in this scenario it was really more about her opening up to me more and the communication just burst wide open at that point. I, I really mm-hmm. enjoyed that section in our, our relationship because it allowed her to just really tell me what she wanted without feeling like she was being judged or anything. And um, the same thing, I was able to ask him questions about what he wanted more of, what mm-hmm. would we be willing to do? Are we okay seeing other people naked? You know, what is what does that look like? It literally changed the dynamic of our marriage by being able to have a honest conversation about what we may encounter when we go there. What are we okay with or not okay with? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we view sex and how do we view us? So through the whole decision to go to Hito, then it became doing more research and being like, okay, you know, there's this group, you, you have more fun if you go with the group, there's this group called Young Swingers that are going, are we swingers? No, not really, but what does it entail if we're in that environment? I took it as an opportunity as we were having these conversations to be like, he's getting ready to turn a certain age, it was a milestone year for him, I'm going to let you have as many blowjobs as you want to, right? <laughs> and that's kind of how it evolved after we were having these conversations. And of course, he's still like, for real, like, this is really happening. Like, I'm, I'm, he's in disbelief. <laughs> as many uh, blowjobs as you want. You hear that, ATL? Yes. <laughs> and that speaks to the, the whole evolution of it, because we had initially talked about soft swapping right and not even really having sex with the other partner maybe just oral sex for the most part Mm -hmm. Um, but she hit the nail on the head that's exactly what we we talked about when we initially got there hey Mm -hmm. oral sex is fine but no penetration i'm like okay well cool you know i get to see you know naked people and i get to get head all right awesome you know no problem but then after we got there i discovered as i was you know messing around with different females the females would feel cheated like they so we got we went this far, but we're not going to have sex. And I'm like, well, according to the rules with me and my wife, that's this is what we already kind of discussed. And so they were mm-hmm. like, all right, well, cool. So I went back and took that information to her because I didn't realize that you know females were going to feel that way. And she was like, okay, well, I didn't realize it was that serious again because we're both new to the lifestyle, brand spanking new. And she was like, well, go out there, have fun, have a good time, just be safe. And I'm like, all right, cool. 
and he gave me the same reciprocity too so you know it was more of a you know we're not what's good for the goose is not you know good for the gander so whatever you're able to Mm -hmm. do I'm able to do as well and so we treated that vacation as that what happens on the island stays on the island type deal and you know it was very strict about okay hey we're not bringing anything back we're not bringing any numbers back we're not communicating with these people when we get back Mm -hmm. like that was going to be in my mind at least for the most part the end of it and then we got back and it just really again opened up that conversation for us to say okay we were able to handle that what's next type deal got it got it and so could do you mind telling us what your play style is at this time um, so we are a full swap couple with other couples, but we mm-hmm. also play separately because we find it very difficult to find four-way connections. And so we have given each other the opportunity to play separately if it presents itself. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, mm-hmm. that four-way connection is the true unicorn. And now I, you know, it, it sounds like it's, it's interesting when we try and engage in these new experiences, what kind of questions it raises. And when it raises questions, there's more conversation, there's more questions, there's more communication. And it sounds like it sounds like you are all in a good place. Now, I want to now sort of transition into talking about um whether your roles, your respective roles in the military or military culture um, had anything to do with you entering the lifestyle, you answered the question I asked earlier about whether the military had anything to do with you deciding to enter or explore the lifestyle, and you said yes. So let's talk about why you think that is. So I think for me, the theme has been at least what, maybe the last maybe three, four years, babe, I've been saying Mm -hmm. I want the next 20 years of our life to look nothing like the last 20 years of our life. Mm -hmm. And for me, of course, the last 20 years of our lives has been put on a uniform, following rules, being in line, the whole being buttoned up and laced up and just towing and following the rules. And I was like, I just want, I want it to be different. You know, we've done so much for others this whole time. It's now time to do something for us. And I've been a big believer in, you know, once the kids are gone and everybody in this roller coaster stops, I still want to be able to look at him and like him. I still mm-hmm. want to look at him and love him. And, I, you know, you get so wrapped up in obligations and keeping the train going. What happens when the train stops? Like, am I really going to look at him and like him as a person, you know? And I really have been working towards shifting that. You know, you see so many people get divorced in their military. They have five, six, seven marriages. And I'm like, we've only been married to each other this whole time. So we've already beaten those odds. Mm -hmm. Let's make our story what we want it to be, whatever that looks like, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. just what I've been actively searching. And I think, you know, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I've been trying to make sure that I remind you of that and that we're cognizant of that as we move into this next 20 years. So again, for me- being buttoned up and laced up. I want whatever the opposite of that is, is what I'm looking for. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah. so it, so it sounds like, you know, you've been, you've been sort of following the rules, real discipline. And, mm-hmm. you know, you're just like, yo, I'm ready to have some fun. Life is short. Like, let's just embrace this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I love that. And so, uh, ATL, what about you? You weren't really sure about this question. I think for me, just growing up in a conservative household, um, going to church every weekend, but then still seeing relationships not work. For the most part, we don't know of any couples in our family that have had relationships that has lasted as long as ours. And this was before we even got into the lifestyle aspect of it. So I said, well, hey, you know, since we don't, know of any that have lasted this long, then why not try something different that I don't see other couples do at all? So I was open to it. Hey, let's go ahead and and, and try and see how it works. And following the rules is key, making sure that I respect her space. I respect her conversations. We sat down and had many, many uh, conversations on what the rules and dynamics and how we were going to play things out just uncomfortable conversations that I Mm -hmm. never thought I would have with my partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just, we adhere to that stuff. Um, It's mainly just about respect. Once we realized that uh, sex didn't necessarily have to have an emotional connection to it with the other individual, once that got sort of put out there, everything was easy after that. 
mm-hmm. uh, at least from my standpoint. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really feeling what you guys are saying because you're actually allowing me to reflect on my own life a little bit because I think I grew up like, a, like really in really strict household, sort of having to follow the rules, and so there was a rebellious side, and you know, I think there is, I mean, I think there is a certain level of discipline that's still required in the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yes. One thing I'm wondering about is if, you know, if there's something about military culture. Um, or something about like having to having to live with some of the some of the realities of the military sort of made it easy for you to apply or to sort of engage with the lifestyle. So I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about because I'm being really vague here. Um, and so, for example, maybe you know the military or being in the air force required you to spend long periods of time away from each other. And so you had to really do a lot of communication over the phone. You couldn't sort of be silent with each other. And so that might have allowed you to be, to have better communication or be able to talk to one another in a very authentic way that is conducive to you really working within the lifestyle in, in, a, in an effective way. I don't know how you feel about that, or if there are other examples that, that, you can think of. So I know when I first came in, and this was what, 1997, 98, at my first duty station, you would constantly hear about people <laughs> cheating on their spouses because individuals would be gone deployed for X amount of months. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, everybody from the enlisted side to even the officer side, you'd have this subculture of individuals basically cheating. Right. And me being, you know, 18, 19 years old, I didn't really even get into it. I just didn't understand any of it at all. There were just these running jokes about people changing the light bulbs on their house and uh, other people coming over while their husbands were gone. And then pilots sharing, you know, wives kind of thing. There was just common jokes like that. And this, I know for me, was just a running theme my entire time, but not something that we had just discussed, you know, amongst us until the last couple of years kind of thing. So yes, there's definitely some type of subculture that was there that wasn't really talked about. Maybe my maturity at the time didn't even lend me to even being open to it, but it was definitely there. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. And so, but it sounds like you all were able to maintain your relationship. I don't know. I don't know, Shy, if you had any other. It's weird because I think that maybe the aspect of us being separated and again, not necessarily the communication, but it allowed us to be okay, not necessarily being together all the time, everything. And so because we weren't attached at the hip all the time, we were able to have our own autonomy, you know, and kind of understand what we wanted individually so that now, you know, it's okay if he's out and I'm home right? Because I I don't feel like I'm missing out on something because there have been times where he's been gone for weeks at a time and I've been home, you know, so it's not, it's, it's not a, as much heartache when he's gone or if I'm gone and then understanding what's important when we get back together. I think because we've been apart and we've had to reconnect, right? You know, back and forth and back and forth. So understanding, okay, hey, we're home. What does that time look like for us? you know, mm-hmm. when we're together and understanding, hey, if you go out on the PlayStation and you come back, what does that time look like for us? And being understanding how to carve that time out because we've had to carve out time from being him being TDY or me being TDY and then coming back together, you know? So I think in that regard, it it kind of grooms you to be able to come back together and have that communication and have that reconnection from the distance, I think. Right, right, right. And I'm I'm wondering if you all know anyone else, know other folks who are in the lifestyle, who know other fellow veterans that have been in the lifestyle at all. Do you it's, have do you have a crew of folks? It's funny because while we were in and act and active, nobody discussed any of this, right? For the most part, it's all hush hush because nobody wants to get in trouble and um you, you want to maintain that quote unquote professional uh, persona, right? But then the minute that you get out, people grow their hair, they change their hair color, and then, you know, everything's open at that point. They discuss and they everything. start showing up in LS groups. So you're like, hey, I knew that person. Exactly. <laughs> and then everything just starts, you know, coming out of the woodwork, you know, at that point. But it's when that person retires and they feel like they're free that we mm-hmm. start seeing 
okay, this person's LS, this person's LS. You start having these conversations, you know, they're, they're down with doing whatever or traveling or going or seeing stuff. And mm -hmm. it, that's when it tends to come out for the most part. So one thing I didn't ask though, so you are, you know, black military vet couple, couple. did you find, I mean, I don't know what diversity looked like while you were in the Air Force and how you've navigated that in the lifestyle since, but can you talk a little bit about that? Has that been an issue for me, for you all? ATL has yes. been more diverse than me. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like me and Bell. Sounds like a me and Bell dynamic. It's, it's hard, at least from my experience, um, to find African-American people, to find Black people in general that are just open and honest about what they're doing. And I noticed this when we went to Hedo. We made sure we went with a group that was, you know, thoroughly mixed, Hispanic, Caucasian, you know, whatever. And we just had a good time. And I find that if I'm talking to my black friends or whatever, it's more along, well, I, I can't never do that. I can't let my wife do this or I can't, you know, let my husband do that. You know, that's, that's cheating. But on the same breath, they'll come back and be like, oh man, you know, me and such and such had a good time. Um, if they were sleeping around with somebody or they have a side boyfriend or a side girlfriend or something, they're willing to talk about that all day, but not the ethical non-monogamous side of it with usually again with my black friends isn't that bizarre isn't mm -hmm. isn't that so weird it's it's like it's like we've we've sort of as, as a society we've gotten so used to being dishonest about our sexual exploits that that's mm -hmm. now the language the only language that's acceptable if you are not really doing your ethical monogamous thing like it's either you're super monogamous or you have a side piece but if you are ethically non-monogamous, that's just not, <laughs> you know, yeah. that level of honesty is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> I was laughing. I was telling uh, ATL the other day. I was like, you know, I got called a whole Jezebel last week. And he was like, what? And I said, yeah, there was a guy I was talking to. I have clearly on my profile that I'm E&M. He swiped on me. We were talking and he's like, oh, I could never do that. You know, because you're, it's almost like you're a Jezebel. And I was like, excuse me, sir. Like, I don't think we can talk anymore because I don't like that. Mm. As far as uh, your preference, um, Shy, I get the sense that you're looking for black, black dudes. Is that, is that fair? <laughs> They have to be brown. They don't necessarily have to be black. They just, <laughs> they just, I don't have an affinity for pink penis or, yeah, it's just not in for me. So any a shade of brown, it doesn't have to be, doesn't necessarily have to be black, just some shade of brown. Right, right, right. All right. Showing love to my Latinx folks out there. Um, <laughs> 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 so... I mean, is it is it hard? I don't know if you guys said this already, but is it is it is it difficult finding other black folks in Texas? Because I feel like Texas still is sort of the epicenter of the lifestyle. You know, you got some really decent clubs out there, few few networks. Um, uh, but I don't know. Have you all taken advantage of that? Is 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 that just is that true just for white people, or 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 does does Texas work out for the black swingers out there too? Uh, I can't really say uh, because, again, we haven't ventured much uh, north from where we are um, mm -hmm. just yet. And so we're still exploring. I I will say, I think for me is I'm picky, I think, and looking for people that have similar lifestyles and, you know, body types has been a challenge for me personally. And so that, you know, it just makes it difficult to find people that I feel a connection with. Um mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that kind of makes it hard. Are there quite a few Black people that I come across? Yeah. Are they all the type for me? No. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, always a challenge, at least for me. But ATL, like I said, he's more diverse. So what do you? ATL, like what's your, I mean, I don't know. ATL, you sound a real similar to me, but I might be wrong about that. Like my dick does not discriminate, but I don't know if you have the same. It really does not. <laughs> Front of the oh bus, my. back of the bus. Oh my it God. It doesn't matter. The way I look at it is I already have a black female at home who sets the standard for me, right? Mm -hmm. So anything else outside of that, Hispanic female, Asian female, it doesn't matter to me as long as our chemistry is good, right? If the, the sexual chemistry is there, then boom, it's probably going to happen. 
But again, if I come across another black female, there are certain barriers that I find that I have to get past, unfortunately, that I don't have to do with other cultures. Um, and I hate Wait to generalize people minute. like that. We got to talk about that. Please <laughs> dig in. What you talk about, bro? <laughs> what are those barriers? Come on now. So, so say, for example, I go to the gym at least four to five times a week. And if I'm, I'm passing a, a Hispanic female, you know, I can smile, say, hey, good morning. How you doing? And then there's there's nothing wrong with that. There's no she's not shunning me. She's also not taking it as an advance either. Right. It's just good morning. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I come across an African-American female or a black female in there, it's oh, I'm not looking at you or, you know, I'm not I don't even want to look in your direction. Usually mm -hmm. most black men will give since there's there's not many Tyrones running around this part of San Antonio. <laughs> when we see each other, we'll give each other a head nod. Right. But mm -hmm. for black females, I don't get that same uh, reciprocity for the most part. It's mm -hmm. I don't, I don't I'm not even looking in your direction. Don't look at me. Don't flirt with me. That's the that's the vibe that I get from a lot of black females. And I'm not even putting it out there like that. Whereas, mm -hmm. again, going back to the Hispanic population that's here, smile, you know, good morning, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's common. It happens a lot. So it's, it's like I have to get past barriers with some black females. And it's unfortunate because, you know, who knows where things could go if mm -hmm. we didn't have to deal with that a lot. What's going on with my sisters in Texas? What y'all doing? Whereas Not I'm responding. in the gym, like, talk to me, and I get no one. So. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, Shy. Is, 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 you know, is it just in our heads here when it comes to the sort of lukewarm response we're getting from our sisters? You know, no, ATL, ATL has lots of evidence to support his theory. So we will, I, he can have that. <laughs> you know, his experiences is. Is there anything you think our audience or any, anything you'd like to share with our audience that you have not shared with me already about your journey and lifestyle, your status in the military? I would just say, you know, couples that are considering making this journey to just do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have an off switch. So if at any point, neither one of us is not having fun or we need to pull the plug, like we can pull the plug, you know, but I think we've grown so much closer um, as a couple, since we've started this journey, um, that there's just no going back now. Like that's, you know, he's my life partner and my best friend. And we just, I get, you know, that compersion sets in, right? Where I'm happy for him when he's out and he's happy for me. And then we can come back together and kind of, you know, make more happiness together, you know? So it's mm -hmm. definitely enhanced um, what we've done. And it definitely is enhancing our retired life. That's for sure. Awesome. Um, I'd say for any couples that might be new to the whole thing um and set your rules early but stay flexible uh for the male <laughs> listen to to what uh, your partner has to say for the most part be open-minded as much as possible and over communicate not just communicate mm -hmm. but over communicate have those uncomfortable conversations i appreciate you all being on the show and sharing your experiences i appreciate it too long time listener I love talking to my black couples in a lifestyle because they like, you know, you, you can, it's, it's really hard to be in this space and not talk about some of the racial dynamics we experience, but also how that, you know, overlaps with the gender differences uh, mm -hmm. between black women and black men. But I really did want to get your take on that perspective that as ATL had shared. I mean, I definitely think, you know, his experiences are valid. I'm sure this happened to him a lot of times. I don't know what's going on with the chicks in Texas. I don't know why they feel in some type of way. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself like that. You know, we all have our off days. But that being said, I think a lot of times black women do have to be on the defensive because like we have folks coming at us from every angle all the time. And so, you know, it, it may be just coming from a place of protection that they're not speaking or not trying to entertain, you know, because, <laughs> you know, 
some women, black women in particular, have been murdered because they didn't, you know, say hey to a dude. They didn't like let him give him the time of day, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as a protective measure, just don't engage at all. Um, you know, that that's kind of unfortunately the state of state of our world that we're we live in. Yeah. So I actually suspected that what. And again, the folk, the black woman in San, it might be a San Antonio um, phenomenon because, you know, in in D.C., I don't really have that experience. Well, that's also because what? <laughs> D.C. is lacking in black men. <laughs> D.C. is lacking in black men. What are you talking the, about? The black man to black woman ratio is far greater than it is in some other places mm -hmm. and because of that there's a lot of fuck niggas in dc <laughs> 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 and so the, the the ladies out here have a hard time like I, I talk to my my single friends and they be having a hard you, and you talk to our single female friends you know they be having a hard time with these dudes out here right but i'm but i'm saying i don't i don't get the sort of like the stank response that it sounded like ATL was talking about in DC is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm saying that's because like the options are few and like, you're a good looking professional oh, man. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> I see. I don't know. I got the impression that there ain't a lot of brothers in San Antonio, Texas, but maybe I, I misheard that. Yeah. I mean, um, there, there might not be a lot of brothers, but I don't, I don't, I don't know anything, but I've only been to San Antonio twice and i don't remember seeing any brothers either yeah and like, so, that's but i don't saying. know but it's like what what's the quality of brothers in san antonio yeah, yeah not I, saying anything against atl i'm yeah, just saying no, no. <laughs> like overall like what is the quality of brothers in san antonio because i know you know i've talked to some women in other places and they're like you know don't i can't date in my area there are black men here like we have a friend we have a friend who moved to texas and <laughs> she is like all the men here are trash. <laughs> like Damn, all the black men here are state. trash. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big state, yo. I think she's actually in Houston. Okay. But still, apparently all the black men, I won't say all, but from her perspective, a lot of the single black men in their mid to late 30s mm -hmm. to mid 40s are trash. <laughs> wow. 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 I mean, the, the impression I got from, from ATL was that he gets such a positive response from from people outside of his race and so from latina women no he said others he said others. oh i ain't hear that part i, I mean it's it's like women. well it's latin because san antonio has right. a heavy, yeah, like yeah. that mm -hmm. that mean if it's either black women or latino women yeah. and then you know sometimes a possible right right but i suspect that 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 response he's getting from the, those women are so positive. And then, you know, when he w runs into the sister, it's not, it's not like that. Right. Yeah. And so he's just wondering like, why? And I think it's less about black women being a certain kind of way and more about like these other racial groups, just mm -hmm. finding black men to be particularly interesting, special and unique in a way that black women may not. Yeah. That's what I really think is going on, but I could be wrong, but I really wanted to get your perspective on that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I think I hear the music coming on. That's telling me. It's time for the hit list. The hit list is basically a list of folks, celebrities, semi-celebrities, people we just seen around the block that, you know, we might like to get down with. So, Belle, why don't you go ahead and tell us who your target is? So, my hit list target this week, we've been watching House of the Dragon. We are behind. Um, but Damn, it's been still? Good. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But... So my actual hit list person is Corliss Valer Valerian, not the actor. I mean, yeah, the actor, but like he doesn't look as good outside of the makeup and the hair and stuff like that. So he has white <laughs> dreads, right? Yeah, they're like yeah. gray, white, yeah, yeah, yeah dreads. Yeah, and then he's cool. got the beard, like, and just his character is a badass. Like, I just like his character's story arc so far. I mean, he was kind of doing a lot trying to marry off his like twelve-year-old um, daughter, but like, <laughs> but I just I like this character. Like he's the richest he's the richest dude in Westeros. He's got pure Valyrian blood. Like 
he's got all the ships. Like, he's doing all the shipping and stuff like that. Like, he's a badass dude. And so, and, and the actor himself, I think I talked about this, has gotten some hate for the character. But, and just like, I'm sorry, I know we have white listeners, but can y'all talk to y'all people? Like, can y'all like have a town hall meeting? I just, I just don't understand like the vitriol and hate for black actors portraying fictional characters. <laughs> Like, these people do not exist in history. <laughs> like, Hall- Halle Berry playing the Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid is a fiction. Mermaids do not fucking exist. Half as far as we know. body is a fish. You okay. ain't mad about that, but she okay. can't be black. <laughs> like, I, I just, I don't. She can have a fish pussy, but she can't. <laughs> she can't be black. It's not right. She's Danish or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> which, and again, which the, a lot of people have explained, there are Danish black people because there are black people everywhere. <laughs> like, there are fucking black people everywhere. So, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. It was a fucking cartoon. She was yellow. <laughs> she wasn't even white. She was, ye- she was yellow. She was drawn with a goddamn pencil. <laughs> right. Uh, so, just, can y'all just have a town meeting or something? Like, Talk, talk, and and I'm being funny now, but now like I'm being serious. Talk to your grandparents, talk to your aunts and uncles. Like, if you are at, we got the holidays coming up. If you're sitting at family dinners and family gatherings, and allowing your family members to make racist comments and not saying anything about it, you are part of the problem. You are contributing to the racist rhetoric in our country. If you just sit there and don't say anything. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. All right. See, I'm a little different in my philosophy. <laughs> oh, okay. Because this shit is just, it's, it's confusing me. <laughs> it's confusing me a lot. Like yeah. the Little Mermaid and, this, and the hate for this dude, it's confusing me because I'm like, yo, just say you don't like black people. <laughs> yeah. Because what confuses me is that, yo, you know, they'll, they'll say all of this shit about, you know, having a, you know, uh, you know, ethnic, you know, um, Ariel, you know, having black people play in all these roles, this so-called woke um, phenomenon in Hollywood, sort of, you know, them being on anti-woke, and then they'll have in, like, their little Twitter posts or their little, you know, forum posts, like, yo, I'm not racist, I have nothing, I, I, you know, I got nothing against black people or African Americans, I support diversity, and I'm like, nigga, no you don't, do you know what <laughs> racism is? Like, <laughs> Actually, I'm I'm disagreeing with you, Bell. I'm just like, yo, when you're at your dinner tables and y'all talking about, and this topic comes up, yo, just say, look, just tell us you don't like black people. <laughs> right. <laughs> just say that. Just and I can't change your mind. Like I'm not here to change your mind. But just say that. Don't fucking bullshit. Just, like why are you right, tiptoeing yeah. around this shit? Like I you know, are so no, pissed was... off. Like history is not gonna look fondly upon these people. Like oh, you no. are so out. We got 40, 50 year old grown men, and you. T- you so outraged about a brown the fucking mermaid the little mermaid nigga like what <laughs> i don't know i don't know it's crazy it doesn't make sense <laughs> i'm over it i'm over y'all but the memes are hilarious I, mm-hmm. the memes yes yeah, keep them coming because like black twitter is undefeated just <laughs> <laughs> undefeated undefeated <laughs> all right so my hit list target so shout out to vision who is one of our patreons um and who has been a longtime listener and who is so thoughtful about the lifestyle you know i was i was on our private chat and i really kind of you know threw my hands up because i've had a really hard time with my hit list for a while Mm -hmm. you know there are attractive people out there but nobody like knew like you know i can't just there are plenty of insta insta models out there with fat asses and shit and i'm just like this is so fucking basic like let, give, give me something different like you know give me some, somebody who moves me and vision came through and introduced me to i want to make sure i'm saying her name right tenariel steffens do you know this woman Mm-mm. so apparently she's an artist mm. and a model and she sings some of the sexiest tracks um so That's T-A-N-E-R-E-L-L-E. If I showed you an image of this woman, first of all, dark-skinned sister, her body is ridiculous. 
her body's ridiculous but it's not just that like the way she carries her body and the outfit she wears like this bitch is sophisticated i don't even know what her sexual preference is like i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised if she was just she, she like if if you asked her like you know what's your sexual preference and she just i, I just fuck angels and unicorns that's <laughs> what, what I, like i i fuck like fairy tale creatures because those are the only people who are worthy of this beauty uh. um she is an amazing woman amazing voice she has these thick lips if i showed you an image of her although you'd find her sexy you wouldn't believe that she actually comes from our time i thought god had discontinued this kind of black woman i thought he's <laughs> i thought he stopped designing this kind of black woman back in like the 80s he was like all right look i, I can't make any more of this and then he just kind of he just kind of deviated from that plan when he made lauren hill and then he was like all right no more this chick is like on that class of black woman. She's so sexy. The way she talks, her voice when she's not singing is still sexy. She could just record and distribute a conversation mm -hmm. and it would probably go platinum. <laughs> So shout out to Tenario Steffens, um, super fucking sexy. I hope her career goes bananas. I think she debuted her first song, uh, first track in 2015 or 14, I can't recall, but she's made some really cool shit. We'll have some of her information in the show notes. And yo, if you guys have some hit lists, people, targets, people you wanna bang, people you wanna get to know, please send us some people there's a lot like i don't watch a whole lot of television so i don't have a lot of exposure and no, you don't okay <laughs> um i mean I, we guess i guess we don't watch as much tv as we used to but no not really like i don't I'm, well i should say like music videos and shit like yeah, i mean yeah. you know what i mean like that's usually where you find like the sexiest people and i've you know on youtube i've just been obsessed with like storytellers so yeah, I don't, I don't get a lot of exposure to this stuff. So yeah, let us know, man, if we're missing people. If you're like, yo, Bell and Bomber, where y'all at? Like, you know, check this person out. Let us know what's up. All right, Facebook fuck shit. Let's go. Hey, yo, what the fuck? You ready for some Facebook fuck shit? Okay, y'all. Hold on to your shit, because this is about to be a fucking wild ride. <laughs> okay, so... Yesterday, our garbage disposal stopped working and I was trying to see why. So I was looking around under the sink and I moved stuff out to get in there to look around more easily. In the very back, tucked away, was a mason jar that I thought was just over halfway full of kitchen grease at first, but I realized it wasn't grease. I thought it looked like semen. What the fuck is going on? Somebody's fucking the disposal? <laughs> I made the mistake of opening it, and by the smell, I knew it was definitely semen. Semen has a smell? Yes. <laughs> what does mine smell like? It smells like a bodily fluid. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Got it. Um, uh, I what, couldn't... Mm, what I kind couldn't of bodily fluid? <laughs> I'm sorry. What? <laughs> 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 I mean, it just smells like, like, I wouldn't say it smells like anything in particular. Like, you know, people be lying and be like, oh, yeah, it smells sweet. It smells like, you know, juices and berries and shit. Like, pussy smells like flowers. No, the fuck it doesn't. It smells like a bodily fluid. Okay. All right. Because ass fluid is technically a bodily fluid. <laughs> yeah, that's but ass fluid is funky. You're No, it's not funky. Okay. All right. That's good. All right. Go <laughs> ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting. <laughs> So I made the mistake of opening it and by the smell, I knew that was definitely semen. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Disgusted, I threw it away in the dumpster outside. It had to have been my husband's, but I don't know why he would save semen in a jar. My husband got home and I asked him about it. He seemed very embarrassed and confessed it was indeed a jar full of semen he was filling for almost a year. I was shocked and asked him why. He said whenever it was my time of month or I wasn't in the mood, he'd jerk off into the jar after I went to bed. I asked him why not go in the toilet or use tissues or in the shower or something. Why a fucking jar? He couldn't answer that other than saying he's been doing this since he was a kid. I told him I want him to stop using a jar because it's disgusting. He told me he didn't want to and asked where the jar was. I told him I threw it away and he was upset. He said it took him a long time to fill the jar that much and now he had to start over and we argued about him using a jar to store his old jizz in. Oh. 
Okay. I still don't understand what why. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't understand why he wants to fill a jar for fuck's sake. We argued about it, and during the argument, he opened the refrigerator, <laughs> took a large jar of pickles, and dumped it out and started rinsing it out and said, This is the new cum jar now. <laughs> Before I knew it, I'm literally screaming at my husband about coming in jars and told him he can either come in me or the jar, but not both. He clutched the jar and stormed off into the bathroom. I was literally speechless. My husband got home and we sat down and talked. After a lot of prying, I got him to come clean with me about why he comes in a jar and why it's in the kitchen. He gets very excited when I eat his cum. And he makes pancakes every weekend for breakfast. Motherfucker. And he mixes the cum into the pancake batter and gets off on me eating it without my knowledge or consent. He has been doing this regularly for our entire marriage and has mixed cum in other things I've eaten and drank. I have, of course, swallowed his cum before, but this is different because he did this without me knowing. Without consent. I honestly consent. (laughs) I honestly couldn't yell at him or even say anything. I felt numb. She couldn't say anything because she had a mouthful of cum. I'm sorry. (laughs) Go ahead. I just got up and started throwing shit in a bag while he tried to talk me down and stop me. I ended up leaving with some bare essentials and told him that I needed space and will reach out to him when I'm ready to talk. I'm taking some time off of work and headed to a friend's house for a few days. I asked her if I could stay and she doesn't know why and honestly I don't want to tell her or any anyone else for that matter i don't know what i'm going to do or what this means for our marriage i feel disgusted used and like trust in my husband has been severely damaged i haven't cried or done anything yet i stopped to get a bite to eat on the way out to my friend's house and try to figure out what to say to her because i know she'll have questions i also think i need to cry first thank you to everyone who's been kind and supportive and offer good advice please keep it coming because i feel like i'm drowning keep it here coming. <laughs> She does like keep it coming, (laughs) and I have no idea what to do. (laughs) Okay, so I got questions about whether or not they had little breakfast parties, like brunch (laughs) parties at the house. (laughs) Like, was other were other people eating the cum? This is a very good question. Yeah, I mean, I guess my question, like the cum, you didn't taste it. Like maybe okay, pancakes, no, but like in drinks. I don't know. I don't think so. If I, I think that flavor can, I, I, mean, I don't. I don't know. I don't know is, what. Apparently, like it tastes like a bodily fluid. So, like it, but it's salty. Though it can be salty, though. It can. Okay. So, because right. like, I'm thinking it's like spit. Like if I spit nah, in your drink and mix it, you're not gonna no, taste it. Nah. In consistency, though. I mean, I don't. How, we don't know how much of it he was putting in. He the had a whole jar. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it's not like one cum shot. Like <laughs> like I don't I mean I don't know what his cum pancake recipe is. I don't know if it's like a half a cup or a whole cup or like a cup and a half. I don't I don't know what the recipe is. So I yeah. guess I, I I wonder how I wonder if it's a good substitute for eggs because eggs is okay. Uh, yeah, I think mm-hmm. what 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 does they call, what do they call that? Eggs just keeps things together or something. There might be an, an yeah, I, but it. I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe it has that function. But there is a there is a fetish question here. Oh, there absolutely is, but there's there's clearly a big consent issue. <laughs> yes, like a huge consent. And I yeah, I understand the fetish of because I think the, the the main fetish is him is her eating the cum without knowing. without knowing. That's the that's like the key to it, right? And she could she could consent to that in terms of like okay, you know, this this month is cum eating month. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> sometime this month, there will be mystery cum in some of my food. <laughs> but, I, but you don't got to tell me. Right, but you ain't got to tell me. And then, you know, the next month, make sure all the food is clean, whatever, like that. So I, I think there was a way <laughs> to meet her, if, if she was open to it, meet her demands for consent and his meet his fetish his kink but this won't it homeboy like what this is immediate grounds for divorce (laughs) no we not we not doing this i hope they can work this out anyway yo i hope you guys enjoyed the episode this month i am sorry we were late but uh we hope the wait was worth it i also want to give a shout out to our patreon members our newest patreon members 
AQ Indigenous Prince and Seto. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for uh, thank you to all our Patreon members. We really appreciate you. Yeah, please hit us up at Black and Kingy Lifestyle at gmail.com. Uh, Bell is going to close us out with all the other ways to reach us. I right, peace out. Bye. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please do check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Black and Kinky. You can also find us under the same name on Cassidy, APG, Amore Getaways, and Patreon. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube under Black and Kinky Lifestyle. Feel free to email us at black, the letter N, kinky, lifestyle at gmail.com. Or call and leave a voice message at 937-462-0744. Bye. Black and kinky, black and kinky. Black and kinky lifestyle.